studying high frequency data and having access to all the possible actions of agents on financial markets can give us a better understanding of how people behave, what they actually do, what are their strategies. So in that sense, get us closer to what I would like to call the law of motion, motion of finance. You know, um, What is the interaction between two agents when they meet? And um, what, how is it described? And um, of course, this is very ambitious and not r very realistic. And we've heard talks about behavioral finance yesterday. We know it's a very complicated thing. But still, there are some probabilistic approaches to them that instead of comparing agents to hardballs uh, in some universe, try to make them behave, statistically speaking, in a more realistic way. So I'm trying to show today some example of what I call statistical dependencies on financial markets. First by showing some examples, then interpreting them, and then finally uh, developing some models that account for these. Okay, so classically the financial mathematics or the financial theory, econometrics theory, they essentially represent the price of an asset and they describe it as a random process. Okay. So of course age, there is no such thing as agent behavior or even trading strategies. Um, and this is the history of uh, econometrics and financial mathematics over the last, let's say, the, the last century, 20th century is good. Of course, thanks to high frequency data, people have long noticed, starting in the mid 90s or maybe, well, early 90s, that many things become observable, which was different, which is a different situation from what it was before. Like, typically, uh, we had a discussion yesterday about that, but volatility is observable. Okay. So there is some kind of theoretical result that says that if you can sample a process in continuous time, then you can evaluate with some convergence, it's integrated volatility. So if you have enough uh, sample of the returns or the stock price, then by doing some subsampling, you can evaluate its volatility as a stochastic process. Okay? And this is, of course, the first uh, step in showing that volatility is never constant, has to be modeled as a stochastic process. But more than that, because we have access to order book data, so orders, the, the order flow is observable. And in the order flow, behind the order flow is, are essentially hidden the agent strategies. So in that sense, you can say that agent strategies, decisions to buy, sell, wait, or be impatient, are more or less observable. Okay. So it, it's been considered a really um, a good gift to scientists that these high frequency data have become available and you can explore the strategies of agents through them while retaining the uh, flexibility of a statistical or let's say probabilistic modeling approach. Okay. So let me just, most of you know what it is, but let me just recall because this talk will be focused on order books or limit order books. Uh, the limit order book is as you probably all know, it's a file in a computer that contains the list of all the orders posted by any agent member of a given market at any given time, buy and sell limit orders. Okay. And there are, of course, in real life and in actual exchanges, there are many types of orders, but for the sake of simplicity and also uh, because there are minor differences, but essentially all orders belong to these three types here. We will describe orders as depending on whether they are considered limit orders, market order, or cancellation of an existing order. So limit order is called a patient order. You place an order and you wait till it is executed. Maybe you wait for an infinite time sometimes. A market order or sometimes it's a marketable limit order. I mean there are many different terminologies. <clears throat> It is an order that leads to an immediate transaction. Okay. I'm deciding that I want to buy now or sell now, and I do it. Okay. And the cancellation is very important. It's actually vital in the good functioning of the markets. It's the cancellation of an order that you have previously posted, but it's not executed, or you're not interested in it anymore, so you cancel it. Okay. And the dependency structure that I'm interested in and I would like to present today is exactly the dependency structures of various types of order with one another. How do uh, new limit order 
influence new market orders? How do a consolation order influence the arrival of a new market order, etc., etc. Okay. And we would like to come up with some statistical properties, but also with some explanation of what is actually going on. And in that sense, it's a step towards deciphering the agent's strategies on the particular market. What I'm trying to call the law of motion, but of course, uh, you know, I'm the only one who's not a physicist here, so <laughs> please correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, so as a subject of interest to many of you and also in the corona physics uh, uh, community, as, and as a natural object of interest for also for statisticians, the inter-event time or duration is a natural object to look at when you want to study the behavior, the arrival of orders on the market. Okay. And I would like to start with this, some remarks that are purely empirical and statistical before doing the modeling part. The early modeling and many models in um, simple models or agent-based models of financial markets or simple statistical models of financial markets, they use the even time uh, the as a clock. Okay, so you have a counter that increases by one whenever something someone d does something, and this is more or less equivalent to homo homogeneous Poisson hypothesis for the arrival of order. But let's look at the um, inter even. So this is an inter price change distribu time distribution. Okay, so you can do this uh, uh, similar. Um, graphs with any kind of events. Here I've chosen the events that changes that are, there is a price change. And if you look at it in regular uh, scale, linear scale, then you get essentially a unimodal distribution. It's hard to see what's going on. Here I have focused on the smaller time scales by blowing them up using a log scale. Okay, So 10 to the 2 means 100 seconds, 10 to the minus 2 means one hundredth of a second, and ALV just some stock on the uh, European uh, bors, Deutsche Bors. What you see here is clearly bimodal distribution, which means that there are several time scales occurring okay, in this price change process. Essentially, there's a peak around 10 seconds, and then there's a peak around 10 to the minus 3 second. Yeah, maybe 10 to the minus 2. I have some parallax here. Yeah. So that means that. And this is a very typical behavior. If you look at the uh, S&P 500 um, futures, the mini spy, so it's another financial asset, very, very liquid, very much traded. Again, you have a bimodal distribution. If you look at this log sp scale, around 10 to the 0, so one second, and 10 to the minus 3, 4, so one thousandth of a second. Okay. Now, if you look at a Poisson-driven limit order book model, this is what you get, of course. You get a unimodal distribution. Whether it is in linear or log scale, you will never see something going on at finer time scales. So Poisson models have only one time scale. Okay. So this is a very trivial remark, but it's a way of saying that, of course, you have to account for more complicated dynamics for the arrival of orders. And these more complicated dynamics should be able to reproduce this bimodal distribution here. Okay. So now I'm going back to, let's say, a little bit more physical approach in the sense that in order to understand that there are some time scales that are different, I would like first to characterize the type of events I'm looking at and to characterize the interactions of these events with one another. And I will come back later, once I have said the models, I will come back later to this inter-event distribution time and see that the models that we provide also are able to get this uh, coexistence of time scales. Okay. So this is kind of an action-reaction principle. Of course, uh, it's um, a very loose statement in the sense that it has been observed, and it's very natural to understand that actions of some sort trigger reactions you know, by other market participants. For instance, it is well known that if you want to buy a large quantity of some given stock and you place a large limit orders, then people will understand what you are trying to do. They will understand that you are interested in buying and they will raise their offer rates, their, their, their bids, 
because they, they see that you are interested, so you're willing to pay a higher price. Okay. So this is a reaction to a natural piece of information. Okay. And we would like to measure the, is this kind of inter-event interactions. Okay. And a natural way to do that is to measure some property, some, yeah, some distributional properties of these inter-event arrival times. Okay. If these events were independent on one another, like I'm placing a limit order, you're sending a market order, someone else is canceling her uh, previously placed limit orders, if all these were independent, whether you look at one distribution or a conditional distribution, you would get a similar behavior. Like in the Poisson case, they all would be identical. And of course, we can show that this is not the case, and I'm going to spend some time studying in details um, what I mean by that. So here are a classification of order. So you see it's a very natural classification, but you, you can see the complexity of the model becoming apparent now. Orders can be classified into essentially 12 classes. Okay, it's, so we, we have designed, uh, we have used this classification here. It was also uh, used by other authors like Jean-Philippe Bouchot or Ramacomte in several related studies, and I will give you some very precise references in the end. Um, let's just say that we are making a distinction between types of order, so market order, limit order, cancellation, on the buy side or the sell side. Okay, so that's six. And then we make a distinction on whether an order affects the current best price or not. Okay. So if the current best offer price is $99 and I'm placing an order to buy at 95, I'm not affecting the current price. But if I'm placing an order to buy at 99.5, I'm making a better offer, I'm affecting the current price. So order Orders with a superscript zero don't affect the price, okay? whereas orders with a superscript one do affect the price. Okay? And of course, people, I mean, you, you, you will tend to think that orders with a one superscript are more informational, you know, because when people are changing the price, they are taking some kind of risk, you know, they're buying at a um, uh, an expensive price, or they're crossing the spread, or they're canceling a good order, etc. So you might tend to think that these orders are, of course, less frequent, which is, of course, true, and more informational. So in the next two slides, I will show some tables, and then I will interpret them. And these tables are essentially a measurement of conditional probabilities. Okay, So assuming that a given order has arrived, say a market order of some type, when is the, what is the next, the immediately following orders? Okay. And this is a um, methodology that will allow us to design a models where there are some dependency structures that are built in. Okay. So let me start with this. Yeah, you, you can see better than I do. Um, yeah, okay. So how do you read these tables? The first column says, what is the conditioning order? So um, if I look at the first line, I'm, look at, I'm looking into the situation where the first order is a limit order to buy that doesn't change the price, okay? And the next column describe the probability of occurrence of an order of type L1 buy, L1 sell, etc immediately following this, okay, what is the probability of the next order be an order of the column name? Okay. Do I have a point? Yeah. Maybe it would be <laughs> simpler with this. Okay. 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 Oh, yeah. Okay, so here, for instance, this is, look at it column-wise. L1 buy order is a limit order to buy that changes the price. It's termed an aggressive limit order, which means that it enters into the bid-ask spread. The 
unconditional probability of such an order is very rare. So it's 2% of the cases. So overall, in the total you know, amount of no orders, these L1 by orders occur only 2% of the time. However, you can see that following an M1 by order, they happen 12% of the time. That's how you can read this table. You look at this one, and you say a cancellation of order to buy following a limit order to buy occurs 5.8 times percent of the time. Okay. So these are calculated, you, these are just very simple conditional probabilities of occurrences. And you can check, I mean you can, you will not do it of course, but <laughs> clearly you can check that line wise the sum is equal to 1, okay? <laughs> because all these possible events follow a given event, so if you add up all the probabilities, it will equal to 1. But what is interesting is the comparison between the, the figure at the bottom here, so typically M1 sell orders, market orders to sell, and market orders to buy arrive with a frequency of 1.3%. And the difference between this unconditional probability and these conditional ones is a key to understanding the dependency structure. So let me give you some explanation and some details here of how to interpret that in terms of action and reaction. Okay. Okay. Let me look into this case, for instance. This is well detailed. I'm not going to go through all these explanations one by one, but give you maybe some of the more uh, relevant and interesting ones. Look at M0 buy. So M0 buy means I'm looking at market orders to buy, but they don't change the price. Okay. Well, what you can see is that it increases the probability of another order of the same type, M0 buy. So go back up here. M0 buy, this one, on average, M0 buy order occurs 3% of the time, which is not much, but following a, another of the same type, it occurs 35% of the time, so it's huge. Okay. What does it mean? It means that these buy orders, would, which don't change the price, tend to arrive as a sequence. Okay. This is a very well-known phenomena. It's called one of them is the splitting of large orders. So if you have a large order to send to the market, you don't send it directly because everyone sees you coming and is waiting for you. So you will see that you will chunk it and send small pieces one at a time. Okay. So whenever there is an order to buy, it tends to be followed by a similar order to buy. Okay. In uh, Bouchot and Lilo and Farmer's uh, terminology, we are talking about the autocorrelation of the order flow. Okay. To, that's only what it means, okay? There's another interesting effect that you can, an interpretation that you can give to this particular uh, situation, it's the momentum effect. Okay? People are looking into the market, they see that people are buying, so they are also buying. It's like it's a gregarious behavior, and these two effects were rather um, in competition in interpreting the articulation of order signs, so which is why at this stage it's very hard to uh, make sure which one is actually happening, but we know both are happening. We know for sure that splitting occurs, and we think that Gregarious behavior explained the, this momentum effect. Okay. Now let's look at this L1 buy. Okay, L1 buy, it's a limit orders to buy, which improves the price. Okay. So at the moment, let's say that the bid ask spread is 99,101. Okay, someone is placing a new limit order at 99.5. So he wants to buy, and he wants to. He's okay to. He wants to buy from you, and he's okay to play to pay a little more than what was before. What is going to happen? What's going to happen is that there is a big increase in this M1 sell market orders to sell. So let's look at this line. We look at L1 buy, M1 sell. Remember that M1 sell are very rare orders. They occur 1.3% of the time. It's a market order to sell that changes the price. So it's, sell, it's selling and it eats up all the liquidity so it goes down the order book, okay? So it's very rare. But following an L1 buy order, it happens 12% of the time. So it's much more frequent. And this is an effect that we have termed the uh, market-taking effect. 
people see are looking at the book, they see a better offer price, they buy it right now. Okay. So they, they, they eat up all the existing new liquidity because it is interesting. So they don't care if they change the price. They, they want to this uh, as much as uh, quantity as possible from this particular new order. Okay. More interesting, maybe I mean more interesting, more original, uh, at least for me it was a, even a surprise. <laughs> there is a large increase of the C1 buy, so consolation of orders. So L1 buy, and C1 buy, okay? So a cancellation of order on the buy side that changes the price means someone was the only one posting an order at some price and it canceled her own, her own limit, okay? So I'm placing an order and then I'm the only one here and I'm canceling everything. What we think is mostly that this effect is like the, um, it's a market manipulation, yes? That is a reflection of high frequency trades. All this is high frequency. No, so there are certain classes of traders who try to ferret out information from the market. Yeah, yeah. They will set limit orders. That's what I'm saying, yeah, exactly. And they will set cancellation orders. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying, yeah. I think that might not be market manipulation. Oh, it is, because in a way, when you play, I mean, it's term market manipulation because you are not willing to trade at this price. That's what I'm saying. So, so they are affecting the price. At, of course, it's very short time scale, but they are sending an information that they want to buy, say. In fact, they don't want, okay. So they want to, yeah. So yeah, okay, I, understand. I see your point, but it is some kind of market manipulation and it's actually, it's actually forbidden. It's uh, unlawful to do so. If you do that on a regular basis, it is. It is quite allowed. Okay, so typically in Europe, there are several laws that say that if you are sending orders, you, okay, it is legal, but you are getting a tax. <laughs> you, you, you have to pay a tax on limit orders that are not executed. And uh, so they are, uh, well, and if you do that very often, the regulation authority will come and see you and tell you what, are you, what is your strategy here? What do you want to do? So it's a, it could be a gray area, but it, it, it's not really considered, I mean, placing an order when you don't want to trade is something that you, want, you don't want to be noticed too often. <laughs> if it is noticed too often, then uh, you will get in trouble with the regulation authority. Oh, okay, but yeah, we can discuss uh, more about it later. So, in any case, this is what I call a fake order in the sense that the order is not here to be executed, but it's here to test the market, see the reaction of the market, and then cancel it and place it differently. It can also be a market making strategy where you decide that you are changing your limits, but still. Okay, so another effect of interest here is the uh, when there is a buy order, or sales, of course a sell order, that consumes all the existing liquidity, okay, then what you see is that a new liquidity replenishing occurs. Okay. So it increases the probability of an L1 sell order and also of an L1 buy order. So let's look at this line here. M1 buy increases the occurrence of these two orders, L1 buy and sell, normally they would occur 2% of the time. Here they occur, well, let's say, almost 12 and 8% of the time. So that explains that when new liquidity, so, the, so there are people whose strategies is essentially based on providing, li sorry, <laughs> providing liquidity. So they are termed uh, market makers, although there is no such thing. I mean, in many markets now, there are no such thing as an official market maker, but still, it's considered a strategy to provide liquidity both on the bid side and the ask side and to hope, you know, hope to make the spread. So whenever an order consumes all the existing liquidity, new liquidity arrives and it arrives faster than in general because th there is this market making strategy. So market making or liquidity providing strategy. Okay. So these figures are the basis for the modeling assumption that we'd like to propose now, and um, that will take into account these action and reactions between orders of different types. So, of course, as you have already noticed, 
uh, I'm not gearing you towards an, a real agent-based model because I'm looking at orders, not agent sending orders, for two reasons. A practical one, which is that in general in the databases that we are using, we don't have the identities of all the agents, so we don't know exactly who is doing what. So that advocates for a probabilistic approach rather than a, a fully agent-based approach. And the other point is that agent-based models are very hard to calibrate because when you're talking about an agent, you're talking about his motivations, his uh, inventory, his uh, long-term perspectives, etc. And those are difficult information to get. So I'm going to propose simpler models uh, based on these statistical properties, but there will be essentially phenomenological models uh, of uh, arrival of events. Oh, I'll skip that because, yeah. So how do you model dependency? Okay, so as I said, simple uh, model of markets is, um, is it called zero intelligence models, where orders of various types arrive randomly according to some Poisson distribution. As we have seen, there are many dependencies that should be taken into account. And I'm sure many of you, you are familiar with these, but hoax processes have been successfully applied to limit order book modeling, as well as many other modeling in many other areas, uh, not like typically neurosciences, earthquake modeling, etc. And um, it's still a very active strand of research, and they, they provide good behavior, good fit to the properties that I've shown. So let me just recall rapidly what a hoax process is. So a hoax process is a point process with an intensity, and the intensity is kind of autoregressive. So it has a base intensity, which would be like a, a background Poisson process driving it. And whenever there is an event, and so as in, it is the counting process, n goes of plus one whenever there is an event, then something happens and there is essentially, in general, an increase in the probability of the intensity and then there is a relaxation. So typical kernel for hoax processes are these exponential kernels because they lead to a Markovian nature for the joint N lambda process. Okay, so this is very useful. It's not essential. There are many non-Markovian hoax processes used in the literature. Uh, we have st stuck to uh, Markovian processes. Okay, th this is just a standard mathematical results on the stationarity of the process. So there is a um, condition on the spectral radius of this matrix. Okay, and just to go back to our initial motivation, here is what the look, it looks like. If you look at the inter-arrival times of Hox process distribution in log scale, very naturally you will get this bimodal distribution because, and this is only for one exponential case. This essentially corresponds to the base background intensity and this will be related to the um, alpha that you get here. So you get several time scales in a very natural way, which is a hint that this could, could be a useful model. Okay, however, it's not the only one, and uh, just uh, as a comment here, just fitting one distribution is very simple. Okay, this is another example of a model that fits very well, the S&P 500 bimodal distribution. This is like a Poisson cluster process uh, of the Neyman-Scott type. So. so let's do a little more than that, a little better than that to understand the use of Hox processes. What do they bring us? Okay. In the recent paper to appear in Qualitative Finance, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was on it, good, thanks. Um, we have made a thorough study of the statistical properties of these models by essentially, okay, so there's a lot of stuff in the paper, including uh, maximum likelihood estimators and uh, optimization procedure, etc. but the, the, the gist of it is these quantile, quantile plots. Here is the QQ plots of so what we term theoretical is not theoretical, it's data. <laughs> so it's a, a real distribution. And, um, oh sorry, yeah, this would be the, uh, the straight line. So this is a quantile, quantile plot for the distribution of inter-event arrivals. And the Poisson case will generally depart from the straight line very much, okay? Whereas the Hoax-based process behave better. Here we have one exponential, 
there we have two exponentials, so it means you know getting closer to a longer memory, but it's still retaining the Markovian prob property. But what you see is that for some examples, like cancellation of orders, you don't perform very well. Okay, and the and typically the cancellation are the worst performers. Now, why is that so? It took us a bit of a time to understand, and then it became very simple. Some orders trigger orders of other types. Okay, this is easily uh, represented by Hoax processes. But some orders, they prevent orders of other types. <laughs> so there is an inhibition effect. And this was not accounted for by the initial Hoax models that we designed. For instance, if you can solve all the existing liquidity at the first limit, you cannot cancel all the liquidity at the first limit. <laughs> I mean, because in general, the second limit will be, I mean, right after the second limit, will have several orders, several people have, having placed order. So if you, if you are the only one at the best limit, chances are there will not be only one agent at the second limit. So if I'm canceling my order, it's very rare that the second limit will be canceled, which has become the new first limit, will also be canceled completely. So C1 by tends to prevent other C1 by even to uh, occur, and vice versa. And this is really what tells you this QQ plot here. The C1 are the worst performers. Okay. How do you account for that? Well, you use nonlinear Hox processes. Okay. So you can model inhibition very simply by letting this phi be negative, not always positive. Okay. In general, the kernel increases the intensity this is the replica effect for earthquake. You have a base intensity and then you have replicas, means the intensity increases. But if you want to do inhibition, you have to decrease it. And if you want to decrease it, you don't want to be below zero because then it becomes negative. It's not an intensity. So you nonlinearize it through some function h. Okay. So we've done that in the paper by using a very simple uh, positive part function, so a truncation function. People, other people use exponential function to, make, to be more flexible, but in any case. And this is the new QQ plot, and you see the performance is, is now much better. Okay. Like if you look at the C1 with the nonlinear two exponential hawks, the fit is almost perfect. For some reason, this one is a little bit less good. Well, not as good, but still. But it's much better than the previously. There is a zoom here. Okay. The previous result was the green line here, and that has become the red triangles. So using Hox processes and incorporating inhibition effects, we are able to design models that are actually performing quite well and represent in a rather realistic fashion the interaction between orders of various types. <coughs> so let me just make a, a not a conclusion, but uh, one before the conclusion. <laughs> Yeah, I'm almost finished. So what about large time behavior in, you know, large time behavior is what happens when you look, you, when you zoom out of the market, okay? You have all these microscopic phenomena occurring at the individual order level, and you look from very far, far away, you know? What do you get? Well, you get exactly what you would get with a Poisson-driven zero intelligence model or with like a Black and Scholes model. You get a Wiener process. So you get a Brownian motion, essentially. So what do you, I mean, not the price. I don't like to use Brownian motion because it's, um, <laughs> it's the motion, the Brownian motion is the integral of a Wiener process. So anyway, so the Wiener process, so pure random walk. What it says is that this model, the big picture, is not enough to make the difference between two models at the micro microscopic level. And that's very important because sometimes when you look at models, you are looking at you know, macroscopic properties or averaging or thermodynamic limits. And if you do that, sometimes you will miss it's becoming very hard to make a distinction between two models that one is very good at the microscopic, the other one is not. But Globally, they look similar. You know, they have diffusion property at the larger time scales, etc. So I think it's um, something that you should take into account when doing micro, you know, microscopic model of financial markets. That you want to have good models, and that the uh, whatever going on at the larger time scales is not always relevant.
The other thing it tells you is that you are losing a lot of information by zooming out, and you are unable to reproduce some stochastic volatility at low frequency, for instance, with such a model. So you need something else, some other ingredient. OK, let me conclude here. Of course, there are many uh, references on agent-based modeling and modeling the interaction between agents or between orders. I'm just giving a few references that most of you have heard of or read. Um, so in a recent uh, past, there were some activity in modeling probabilistically the order books, but with dependencies. So uh, there's a nice paper by Mathieu Rosenbaum, Huang, and Leval on how to model these by Markovian intensity, so state-dependent intensity. There are other papers like ours or Emmanuel Bacri and Musi and co-authors on well, order books, essentially based on Hawkes processes. Okay. And I'd like to mention that there are some ongoing work and interesting applications to optimal trading particular optimal placement of limit orders, okay, which is a non-trivial problem due to the high dimensionality of the models. Here it's a 12 Hoax processes model, 300 parameters, so it's a bit complicated. Okay, and of course, uh, just as a conclusion, I would say that there are a lot of work to be done in particular to account for the competition really between agents. So here we've described a reaction, but agent, they have some you know, aims, targets, and they are competing with one another to get this. So it would be some kind of game theoretic approach, but it's uh, really in its infancy. And um, I would like to mention a nice uh, contribution by Damien, Nirban, Bicas, and co-authors on uh, competitive resource allocation in the field of um, um, econophysics, but it has yet to be, I think, uh, applied to financial markets as um, with a realistic modeling using order books. Okay, so I'm done. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, of course, so I didn't show the graphs here, but we have a conditional median and conditional mean waiting time conditioned by all the same orders for the other orders, yes. And of course, uh, they are really different from the unconditional ones. For example, the case that Yeah, so <laughs> that's a good point. Um, actually, in a previous work, which I've shown already, it was a joint work with uh, Yohane Munitoke, uh, we studied exactly this. So uh, not for consolation, by the way, but we studied exactly the inter-event distribution conditional to a given event. And um, because of the higher number of parameters in the new models with this 12 Hawks processes, it was becoming a bit cumbersome to interpret them. You know, you would have uh, 144 graphs, so it was a bit complicated. But yes, uh, there are some nice results, uh, and what you're saying is true, yeah. Yeah. So this is from data. This is a stock a ALV on the Deutsche Börse. And the other one is the uh, S&P 500 mini SP futures. Yeah. So this is, yeah. And the thing is, as you see, it's a log scale. Otherwise, you won't see it. Because it's, you know, it's really very small time steps here. 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3. So they're very much compressed. And you don't really see this bump. Almost not. So which is why we, we blew it up by using a, a logarithmic scale for the time interval. This clearly tells the finance story which is actually happening. Sorry? There are, now, this is a uh, market. This is the Deutsche Bourse, so this is the uh, DAX. It's one of the stocks that's part of the DAX index. And this is, uh, I think, 2014 or 2015. Uh, yeah. 
during this time there have been a class of traders who have come out whose job is to trade very very fast they are yeah, of course, we yeah. call them the high frequency traders yeah no so <laughs> me who is not a high frequency trader yeah so this bimodal distribution fits nicely into the two horizons that the normal traders yeah. have and the machines have. yeah Okay, so I, I see your point. Actually, high frequency trading has been on for about almost 10 years in Europe now. And uh, up to 80, 90% of the transaction come from algorithms. So, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm quite aware. But I don't think these two time scales are related to human versus machine. I'm not sure, human versus machine. Because, you know, machine, they actually do the splitting of orders and which means that there will be a lot of things going on at very short time scales, okay? But also there are some bursts of activities and in between there's nothing. So it's not because it's a human, it's because it's a decision to do something. So it's like you want to trade every 10 seconds for, because you have signals every 10 seconds, but once you trade, you trade very fast, you see? So it's not necessarily because you're a high frequency trader. I mean, it could be, but it could also be because you have signals to trade that comes not as often. And, but once you want to trade, then you trade very fast. So I think it's a little bit more like this because typical, even high frequency traders, their horizon, to the carry horizon, it's not the millisecond. So they, they, they trade very fast and they react very fast, but they carry the position for some time, few seconds, few minutes, Sometimes, so there are. I think a, a little bit. Uh, it's a. It's a little bit hard to d make a distinction between high frequency traders and non high frequency traders at the moment because everyone is algorithmic. So, <laughs> but uh, I, yeah, I see your point. It's a, it would be a nice story if it were true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 